Welcome to PlatformCon. Platforms are a very popular concept these days and rightly so. In fact, many of you might be designing or building platforms right now. But as architects, we should also look behind what makes platforms so special and what we need to keep in mind as we're building platforms. My name is Gregor. I am an enterprise strategist with Amazon Web Services. I'm also an architect who is interested in platforms and I also like to write books and I'm currently writing one on platform strategy. So when we look at platforms, the picture that often comes to mind looks as follows. We have some sort of common set of components where all the you know, generic stuff, all the common stuff goes and on top we have all the things that are unique. And while this looks you know, interesting in theory, we can guess that there's a lot more behind it. So let's dive in. Well, first of all, the idea of platforms isn't entirely new. We have many great examples where platform architectures have transformed entire industries. One of those industries is the automotive industry where there's a lot of engineering going on. At Amazon, we call this the undifferentiated heavy lifting that's going on in engine, transmission, you know, emissions regulation, anti-lock brakes, all these amazing things that make cars efficient and safe, but that the customer actually doesn't see. The customer sees you know, the color of the interior, how nicely the doors close and how comfortable the seats are. So the automotive industry many decades ago has realized that, hey, we can do this heavy duty engineering under the covers once and then we can put different hats on this base platform and sell this to different customers to different target segments. You know, this concept has been enormously successful to the extent that Volkswagen Group, for example, builds models ranging from an Audi A4 to a Bentley Bentayga onto the same platform. So yeah, we should be able to do the same in software. But as we embark on this journey, we need to understand what are the mechanisms behind here that make this work or that could also present pitfalls. Now, the magic of platforms is that platforms standardize, but usually we associate standards with taking freedom and flexibility away, right? The standard says, you got to do it this way. If you want to do it and do another way, right? That is against the standard. But there's a different kind of standard, a standard that actually boosts innovation. And I have two fantastic examples. A great lesson about standards stems from Baltimore, 1904, almost 120 years ago, where the city of Baltimore burned down in a giant fire. Well, fire codes weren't exactly what they are those days. Now, as you would imagine, the firemen from all the surrounding towns would come to help. But in the end, they couldn't do much except stand idle and watch the town burn down because their hoses wouldn't fit on Baltimore's fire hydrants. There was no standard for couplings and fittings for fire hoses. Now, that you know, sad lesson has taken hold and since then there is a Baltimore standard for fire hydrants and hoses to make sure that any fire truck can in fact connect to any fire hydrant. And that's a very useful standard. Likewise, one of the earliest ISO, the International Standard Organization Standards, is the metrics group. And that makes sure that if you connect one piece to another, you can take any piece as long as it conforms to the standard and they will connect. Of course, we have examples out of technology as well. Probably one of the most impactful standards we have seen is HTTP. It made sure that any browser can connect to any web server and that standard has actually been a huge innovation booster. Right? We can't imagine the world without that standard. So what we learn here in a, in a punchy way from, from my book, The Software Architect Elevator, is that standards don't actually reduce creativity. They can boost creativity. Right? Nobody can come and say, I cannot really be creative because you gave me A4 size paper. A4 size paper is highly standardized. It's 297 by 210 millimeter. It's 116 of a square meter large. And at the same time, 
nobody's creativity is impeded because of that, rather the opposite. Nobody has to argue about how big the paper will be and how big the envelope and how big the drawer for the paper should be. So we're realizing here that locking some things down and agreeing on a few things can actually boost innovation and creativity. And platforms are right in the center of this. So my favorite quote here is from Peter from ThoughtWorks who says, platforms are really a way to centralize expertise. You don't need to reinvent the wheel um, team times. You do this once and you do it right, but you do not centralize innovation. You leave that to the teams who are closest to the customer and have the best ideas and they will build on top of this common platform. So you might say, sounds great. Right? I want one of these platforms, but as always in architecture, there are some words of caution. Not everything that's a common layer underneath actually makes a platform as appealing as this picture sound looks. So if we learn anything about architecture, the interesting things are always between the boxes and the same is true for platforms. What makes a platform successful is very much how do the little blue boxes interact with the large orange box. Platforms need to have low friction. You cannot force anyone to get on your platform. If you try, they will find other ways to get their work done. And you know what? They probably should. They have work to do. Platforms are not black boxes. People depend on the platform, so they need to have some insight into what's going on inside the platform. And if there's a problem, they need to be able to tell if it's them or if it's in the base platform. So good platforms are transparent. And largely, transport platforms, even though they have a certain kind of magic, they cannot solve all problems. It's a shared responsibility between the people who use the platform and the people who build the platform. AWS is a great example. AWS can do amazing things, but if you build a horribly insecure, brittle, non-scaling monolithic application, the platform itself cannot fix that for you. You should build applications that take advantage of the platform and work hand in hand. And that's when you get the magic. Now, this is an important lesson for more traditional IT organizations because they have a big orange box and that's called sort of IT service management. You know, those are the people who provide servers and databases to the other teams. And they say, look, we have a platform. Unfortunately, what they have might look the same in a high level picture, but is actually the exact opposite because it's not low friction. It's not enabling people. It becomes a bottleneck. Adding a new customer is often expensive. You need to fill out cumbersome forms. There's a lot of processes. So in my book, I create this table of saying a platform is fundamentally different from an IT service. And most of those differences are in the interface. So don't be fooled by the picture of the common layer. A common layer can be many things. It is not necessarily a platform. So if you want to do this right, if you want to build a platform that enables teams to be more efficient, that is low friction, transparent, and a shared responsibility, there's two ways to do that. Well, the first way is you're somehow smarter than anybody else and you anticipate everybody's needs and you implement those things into your platform and everybody lived happily ever after. Well, the other way is you evolve the platform. You start with some useful pieces you observe what people need and often you can do this through the platform usage yourself and you start augmenting the platform. Now the choice is yours. I would bet to say that one of these approaches is a lot more likely to bear success than the other one. At least I don't feel I'm smart enough to anticipate everybody's needs. So with that in mind and having the right mindset about platforms, you need to make decisions. I'm a big fan of saying, Architecture is a series of non-trivial decisions. So the same is true when you're building platforms. The first thing is when you're a platform, you want to make people's lives easier. Often we call this reducing the cognitive load or the learning curve, um, taking friction out. Right? They need to be better off with the platform than without the platform because otherwise, why build one? So an important decision is, what mechanisms are you using to achieve that? 
and what are you trying to do? Like a noble objective is to make a platform. Maybe if it's not easier to use necessarily, it makes it safer. It makes it less likely that you're making mistakes. And you can do that by hiding corner cases or complexities, right? Speeding up teams is always good. Maybe with samples or blueprints or better self-service. So there's a number of things that you can do and the list is probably longer than you might have thought. So as always, it's good to know what are you after? Are you after productivity? Are you after better collaboration? Are you after better compliance? Um, or are you after minimizing mistakes? And then technically, how can you do this? And what are the mechanisms that you have at your hand? And pulling from this list and being clear what dials you're using to build this architecture is a very important first step. When we look at how an architecture or how a platform makes people's lives easier, people's lives aren't static and their development lives aren't static either. They go through a learning curve and they also go through a product life cycle. They start simple and then their needs and their ideas will become more sophisticated and more complex and the scale of what they operate might also increase. So a common problem with tooling is that there's an initial learning curve. Like even if you want to do Hello World, it takes a certain amount of effort. And in some platforms that effort can be high. We call this a cliff, right? There's a lot to do before you can get anything done. Now you want to reduce this. You want to give people a smooth start, but of course reality isn't as easy. You'll never get sort of a perfect linear curve. And you need to be aware of what trade-offs you're making. Maybe you're making the initial experience easier because baking in assumptions in your platform, but as soon as people reach the stage where these assumptions are no longer given, their life becomes disproportionately harder. And that's what's called the hockey stick. Or your platform might have different ways of doing things, and that's better than the hockey stick, so they can shift from using one service to another service, but in between there's a gear shift. They need to learn new things. So having a clear view of where your platform makes your users' lives easier and what that shape looks like over the lifetime is a great exercise at the beginning of building a platform. Now, in almost all cases, you're not going to build a platform in isolation. You're going to build it on top of a base platform. Well, AWS is one of those great base platforms. But now you need to be aware the base platforms aren't static either they also grow. So another important decision to make is what will you do with your platform when the base platform grows? And again, there's two schools of thoughts. You can leave your platform the same because you invested all this kind of money and we call this a sinking platform as the water level rises, right? It might be justified from investment, but really you're sort of duplicating things that are now in the base platform or you build a floating platform where when the base platform gains the capabilities that you have built, you say, oh, perfect. I don't need my part anymore. I can let the base platform handle that and I innovate further on top. I build new things. Now, both are sensible choices and it's very important to make this clear upfront with your stakeholders. If you're building a floating platform, they need to be prepared that you will be throwing things away as soon is the best as the base platform has the same capabilities. And so it's like a submarine and a boat. And a last decision to be made around platforms is how do the parts of your platform interact? And the metaphor I like to use is fruit salad versus fruit basket. In a fruit basket, the pieces are fairly self-contained. The value of the platform is just there in one basket. And that is good. But that's not the full strength of the platform. A fruit salad achieves more. It has the right proportion of fruit in bite-sized pieces. And if they need to be a little bit more apple than orange, you don't need to put a whole apple and a full orange into the fruit salad. But your value proposition goes up. If you go to the market, you're almost guaranteed the per kilo price for fruit salad is higher than a fruit basket. So when you build a platform, don't just make a loose collection of things. Think about how you can make a fruit salad and enable new use cases.
like a picnic. Much easier to do with a fruit salad as opposed to a fruit basket. So this as a little teaser of what's behind the Magic App platform, but also the thinking behind building platforms. I invite you to have a sneak peek at the book that I'm writing. It's on leanpub slash platform strategy. You can register there. We also have a small extract of that in your digital goodie basket. And of course, I encourage you to take part in our live Slack channel and ask any questions you might have. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the conference.